Good morning. Uh, so let's start the morning section uh, so that we can keep on schedule. So today for our first um, lecture, we have Nadia Young, who will talk about resource theoretic quantum thermodynamics. Thank you. Um, okay, thanks for having me here and thanks for being here so early, even after like a very intense uh, session yesterday. Um, I'm very glad to uh, be part of this conference. Um, thanks for the invitation as well uh, to the organizers. So today I talk about um, quantum thermodynamics. This is the more long-winded title of my talk. Um, but let me just uh, outline a bit what I plan to do. Uh, uh, even before I start, maybe I want to apologize a little bit for the aspect ratio of this talk. And it, the size might be a bit too small, and maybe you won't be able to see some of the words. Um, but I'm really sorry for that. You probably have to rely more on hearing what I say. <laughs> um, uh, but let's uh, look at an outline. So uh, for the first half of my talk, which is like maybe 15 minutes or so, I plan to uh, give a more general introduction to the field of quantum thermo. And my hope is that, well, um, you will be able to gain, gain a bit more appreciation for the field by itself. Um, then after that, I zoom in on this resource theoretic approach, which we have also heard a lot about during this conference. But in particular, I want to maybe spell out in the resource theory of thermodynamics, um, what are the different state transition conditions that we have derived and in order to ascertain whether a state transition can happen or not. Um, and then lastly, we would apply these um, results to study well the maximum efficiency of quantum heat engines. Um, and of course, uh, because this is also a relatively long talk, um, I will be also mentioning many different works that are not done by me, so I want to really stress that there's only a, a subset of works which I'm directly involved in, and uh, I list them here along with uh, my collaborators as well. So um, let's start, and um, maybe starting by acknowledging the fact that uh, thermodynamics itself is an old, old subject. It's been very well studied since even the 19th century. In fact, it's so well studied that um, if you are a typical physics uh, student, you would have already encountered it in um, first or second year of your undergrad education. Um, and thermodynamics back then, I suppose, was applied to heat engines, you know, huge uh, pumps and steam engines and the like. Um, and it was really useful back then because although these systems might be very complicated from the microscopic mechanics point of view, they can be very efficiently described in terms of certain macroscopic variables such as um, volume, pressure, uh, energy, and so on and so forth. Um, and this is really essentially because these systems usually comprise of a large number of identical particles, and so is the case with the environment that they are interacting with. Uh, this is called the thermodynamic limit. And in this limit, statistics really becomes very useful because you single out the time average and ensemble average behavior of the system as its defining characteristic. Beyond this limit, nothing really matters. Um, and of course, thermodynamics started out as a very empirical branch of uh, physics in the sense that uh, think about the second law, for example. Historically, it's been formulated in so many different ways. You have the Clausius statement, you have the Carnot statement, you have Kelvin statement, and they, all, uh, they are all actually related to each other. And it was only a bit later when uh, equilibrium statistical mechanics was developed and people began to kind of re-derive and ground these observations from the basic uh, assumptions. So because thermodynamics has been yeah, around for so long, it's kind of evolved along together um, with the rest of physics, uh, in, in particular being refined to suit uh, new physical systems that people are interested in. So the first kind of wave of refinement came when we entered the so-called mesoscopic regime, where, um, for example, you have protein molecules, and they start out, in essence, in some non-equilibrium state, uh, but they interact with an equilibrium uh, thermal environment and they would thermalize and go towards some steady state in, in the process. Um, and thermodynamics has become very different in the light of these non-equilibrium processes. Um, and it's not maybe so clear anymore how 
actually systems would interact and exchange heat with their immediate environment. So many different specific models of system bath interaction has also been studied. And even the second law has seen refinement on this level because you can have um, a statistical version of the second law uh, that holds for individual uh, particles in their phase space uh, tra trajectories and there are statements that say that well entropy would increase with a high probability depending on the size of the system. Um, so quantum thermodynamics, the essence of this um, field is to study well what happens if now the systems that you look at are not just mesoscopic but they are also quantum mechanical. Um, we've seen so many examples well throughout this conference already. For example, you have heard yesterday about algorithmic cooling, which is one of the classic tasks in quantum thermal today. So you could, for example, have schemes of um, quantum refrigerators that would help you to cool down systems, initialize and prepare states for computation or even error correction. Now, one can also envision having a heat engine that extracts work where the machine is just a single ion that interacts uh, in a cyclic process uh, with its thermal environment. And this process could, uh, for example, at the end of the process, you could extract energy and store it somewhere else as work. Um, clearly, in this kind of pictures, some kind of thermodynamics is involved, but you can't uh, exactly apply our understanding of macroscopic thermodynamics or even mesoscopic thermodynamics to these pictures. And the reason for that uh, maybe it can be summarized a little bit, uh, although it might be obvious. Like in classical thermodynamics, you would deal with systems or bars which are huge. I mean, your bars is usually infinite in size, infinite degrees of freedom. You have um, continuous energy spectrum. The temperature doesn't really change, so on and so forth. Uh, the machines itself are probably systems which are started off in some equilibrium state as well. And this is no longer the case uh, for quantum thermodynamics when the interaction is very local, um, the states are initially prepared in a very precise way, etc. Now, there's also the question of uh, coherence and entanglement coming into your system, and it's not clear how, uh, in a generic way, they affect the performance of your uh, thermal machines. Of course, there are some examples known, but there's nothing is really known very generically. Um, the last one here uh, cons concerns like a debatable definition of work, and I will say more about this in a few minutes, but this is a problem that has already been noticed when you look into mesoscopic thermodynamics, and now in quantum thermal, it becomes more pronounced. Um, so essentially, the question is, how, does, how can our understanding of thermodynamics be, be refined uh, to suit the context of dealing with such quantum systems. Um, I think the big questions in thermal can safely be summarized into these four categories, namely the first of all, the mechanism of equilibration, and then you have the energy cost of certain information processing tasks. Uh, of course, there's the effects of coherence and entanglement, and then lastly, the good designs or efficient designs of useful quantum thermal machines. It's probably nice to see that uh, in all of these different questions, uh, tools from quantum information have contributed uh, in different manners. So let me go through some examples. Um, probably the nicest one to see is the fundamental of question of, well, why do systems equilibrate or thermalize? And if you think about it, it's maybe at the first glance hard to reconcile the fact that thermodynamics has um, irre irreversibility as its kind of core character where uh, fundamental mechanics, classical or quantum, would be reversible. And in statistical mechanics, you have a very central assumption which is called the principle of equal a priori uh, postulates. And so this uh, assumption says that, for example, you have a system and of course there are certain constraints uh, that are uh, that constrain the system, like for example, conserve quantities or so on and so forth. But even with these constraints, you can have different uh, valid microstates that the system can uh, consistently occupy. And this postulate would say that, well, a state should 
we, we always assume that the state starts out in the uniform probab uh, probability distribution over all of these valid microstates. Or maybe in quantum information language, like it's the maximally mixed state over the, the support of these valid microstates. Now, this is a very central assumption in statistical mechanics, and it seems also quite reasonable, but the fact that it just exists, there's not really so much justification from the mechanics point of view, maybe except the fact that it works, it predicts things very well. Um, however, um, further justification has come from uh, quantum information by using the fact that uh, typical pure states are also highly entangled. So the statement is really as follows. Um, you can look at large global uh, pure quantum states, which are well, here bipartitioned into parts that we call the, the reservoir or the um, environment and the system. And if you pick a random pure state according to the Haar measure from this global um, Hilbert space, and if we then now look at the reduced state of the system, then with high probability, the system would look as if it is already maximally mixed. And the larger the dimension of the um, reservoir compared to the system, um, the higher, like the closer this uh, reduced state would look um, to the maximally mixed state. So although you are really dealing with you know, pure states um, on the global system, uh, on the reduced state, it really looks like the microcanonical ensemble from statistical mechanics. And of course, uh, these results have also been um, generalized in the sense that not only looking at uh, a random state uh, from the, uh, uh, from the ha drawn from the Haar measure, but also looking at subsets of more physically motivated states, such as matrix product states. Um, maybe more relevant for today's talk is actually the question of uh, the, the relation of information uh, processing with its energy cost. And the easiest way to maybe illustrate this relation is to look at what is called the Landauer's process. And its original version, which was formulated uh, by Landauer in 1961, says that, well, if you have a system, oh, if you have uh, some piece of information, which is encoded in some physical system, and let's suppose that you want to erase the system, meaning setting it to a pure initial state. And Landauer's principle tells you that, well, in order to do that, you would have to invest a minimum amount of work, which is equal to k times t times the entropy of your information, uh, where t comes from the surrounding bars of the system. And this amount of work would be irretrievably lost as heat dissipated into the environment. Now, of course, uh, there is a lot of discussion going uh, about uh, stating the exact principles of Landauer's uh, um, statement because, I mean, because of its generic uh, claims. But um, if you are interested, then there's also a very nice paper by Reeb and Wolf, which spells out kind of the exact uh, precise assumptions in a very quantum information language. Um, so. Um, besides the fact that um, of Landauer's principle, there's also the reverse statement uh, made by Szilard. So Landauer says that, well, if you want to erase energy, uh, erase information, then it would cost you work to do so. But Szilard says the opposite. He says that, well, if you have an, uh, information about a certain physical system, then you can utilize this information uh, so that when the system interacts with a heat bath, you can then draw uh, work out of uh, draw energy out of the heat bath and store it as ordered energy, which is work. And um, perhaps a very crude illustration of this is usually depicted by saying that, well, I have a piston uh, which contains one particle. Um, you can assume that it's a one particle ideal gas, for example. Uh, and I have the information that the particle, I know that it's in the right partition of this piston. And now by utilizing this bit of information, I can insert the partition, attach some uh, spring in a certain way, such that when I expand this gas, I would be able to extract 
um, energy and store it as work. Now, very crude example, but also the general point is that you can prove such principles by assuming certain uh, system bar interaction models as well. Um, so the fact that these relations exist also um, kind of means that techniques that we know in data compression might be very useful for uh, work extraction. Because if you know how to kind of compress uh, the entropy in your data into parts which is completely mixed and one part which is completely pure, then you can utilize this pure amount of information uh, to uh, extract work. And maybe one thing which is uh, also interesting to note is that uh, the fact that conditional entropies can be negative has also been noticed to have implications in terms of uh, work input when you look at the the uh, question of erasure. Because if you are entangled already with the system that you want to uh, reset, then not only you wouldn't need to input work now, but you can actually reset the system and also extract work in the process. Of course, it's not for free. You exhaust entanglement in, in the meanwhile. Uh, but that gives a very nice interpretation for um, the conditional entropies that are negative. Um, so motivated by these data processing questions, um, some of questions can also be very frequently stated as questions of state preparation. Namely that I give you n copies of some initial state, I want to achieve some target state, uh, row prime, and then the question is, well, what is the optimal rate of conversion that I can perform this uh, preparation uh, via some Rule, somewhat dynamical rules. And um, this is where also the resource theory approach uh, for thermodynamics comes in. And because it has a very similar structure to um, the resource theory of entanglement, um, we also see many results that come in from entanglement distillations and um, uh, second order asymptotics. They also find their significance now in the world of quantum thermal instead of just information theory. Um, so because of all these different questions, there have also been different, uh, various different approaches when it comes to studying uh, quantum thermal, even in, in the theoretical framework. So besides um, resource theories, um, which will talk about uh, free states and free operations, you have quantum fluctuation relations, which start with a very different flavor. They would say that I have my system in already in some equilibrium state, and I would want to um, look at driving protocols that would actively push the system out of equilibrium, and we want to see how the system responds to these kind of protocols. Now there's also the camp of uh, master equations where you really look at specific type of bars and uh, s coupling strengths and you solve the differential equations. You're interested in the dynamics of the system. Of course, all of these approaches are very valid and very complementary to one another. But I remember when I first entered the field, I noticed that um, although we all work on the same questions, we don't really understand one another. And as a result, we are always at each other's throats. Uh, it's, it's kind of a, it's a very challenging situation back then. But I think now there is much more crosstalks between the different camps. And this is a healthy uh, way to go. It's, it's uh, very rightfully so. Um, it's maybe even like a div diversity problem, but on the level of scientific um, approach. Um, I promise to say a little bit about uh, defining work. Um, I might just go and blab, blab off because I find this kind of question quite interesting. But maybe let's start by asking, well, why do we even have to discuss this in quantum thermal? When in classical thermal, people just breeze over the subject. I mean, uh, how is it so hard to define what is work? So. Think about the classical scenario um, where you ha really have macroscopic systems. If you want to store uh, ordered energy as work, you would put it in a physical system. And that's, that physical system is usually referred to a weight or a battery um, for obvious reasons. Now, the classical picture would be having a, a weight uh, on hung by a rope, and extracting work would be to maybe 
um, lift the weight by a certain amount of height and storing it in terms of, say, gravitational potential energy. Now, of course, there are going to be some fluctuations which are coming from the environment, but I mean, they are really small compared to the amount of work that you are storing in the system, and it doesn't really affect uh, how much work you can get out of the weight at the end of the process. So by physicist standards, these uh, fluctuations are really non non-existent. Um, this is radically different when you look at quantum thermal, when you try to store energy in a quantum system itself, because these systems can have energy scalings which are so small that they are more or less on the same order of the fluctuations um, that they experience when they interact with the thermal environment. And essentially what I'm saying is that for most uh, quantum thermal protocols where you extract work and store, store it, um, you can't really uh, make a very clear-cut distinction between what is work and what is heat. Uh, and this has kind of resulted in a very uh, many different approaches when it comes to the problem of defining work. Uh, seriously, if you take 10 people who work in quantum thermal, they might just be able to come up with 11 different versions of you know, how we should really define work. Everyone has an opinion about this. And um, <laughs> you laugh, but it's, it's really annoying because you, <laughs> you, can, have, you can really have um, several protocols, um, thermodynamic protocols, may be work extraction or cooling, and you can't really compare them because they are doing things which end in a quality of work which is very different, might be very different. So you can't really compare, say, this is better or the other. Um, you can't make like optimal claims that says, oh, I achieve Carnot efficiency and therefore um, this is optimal because you still have to analyze like what is the quality of your work. And maybe worst of all is that, well, although we know that average energy increase in the battery is probably not going to be a very good measure because it doesn't account for ent entropy increase in the battery, uh, nevertheless, many uh, heat engine protocols actually use this as a measure of how much work they're uh, extracting. So this is a problem. And later when I talk about heat engines, I also hope that um, uh, I will mitigate this to some degree but um, let's see. Um, so next I want to talk uh, really about resource theories. And we have already heard a lot about this, so I'll be quick. Um, a resource theory would be identified by several elements. You have operations that are cheap and therefore you allow for free. You have free states, you can generate them easily. And then the question is, well, uh, given these rules of the game, can I achieve a, parti a particular transformation or not? And th to answer this question, we usually derive uh, quantifiers or monotones, uh, which are functions that are monotonic in the direction of the state transition. Um, there are many examples of resource theories and thermodynamics is one of them. Uh, where, which brings me to the basic paradigm of uh, resource theory uh, quantum thermal, uh, which is called thermal operations, where what happens is that the free operations you have uh, allow uh, global energy preserving unitaries across all of your systems. And the free states are any Gibbs states of a fixed temperature. So you can choose any kind of Hamiltonian that you like as long as I give you the Gibbs state at a fixed temperature. And actually this very simple picture already captures the different notions of um, laws in classical thermodynamics because you have, well, energy preservation coming in simple as, uh, as the first law. And if you think about the question of why we should allow Gibbs states, now there's, of course, the equilibrium literature that tells you that, well, this is uh, the long-term steady state the system would go to. But there's also a very nice operational uh, justification for this because Gibbs states are the only unique states that are completely passive meaning that if even if you take arbitrarily many copies of a Gibbs state, uh, and if you are allowed to do unitaries on these states, you cannot further lower the energy, and, and therefore extracting works and storing it somewhere else. So this means that actually if you have any other states which are not non-Gibbsian, and you allow them as free states 
under this uh, assumption of energy preserving unitaries, then you very quickly trivialize your resource theory uh, by allowing for all sorts of different state transitions to happen. Um, and this also kind of single out temperature as the kind of unique quantity that relates to different free states, um, which is can be seen as an analog of the zeroth law, I suppose. The second law would be then the state transition conditions. And interestingly, there are many works, uh, well, many as in two, <laughs> works on the third law, which shows that um, it's a special case of this uh, second law, which tells you that you would need infinite resources if you want to really cool down to zero temperature. Um, so that's, that's kind of the mathematical uh, description of it, where you have unitaries, oops, you have unitaries which uh, commute with the Hamiltonian and therefore they preserve energy. You have Gibbs states coming in here and then you trace out the bus at the very end of the procedure. And the question is, well, when can the state transition happen? Now, it's useful to kind of recall here that classical thermodynamics would tell you that, well, because this is a scenario where a system exchanges heat with uh, its thermal environment. So um, the free energy should be dictating whether the transition is possible or not. Um, however, in this framework, things will be, the conditions will be much more stringent. Uh, and well, for today's purposes, let us just focus on the case where your initial state itself is already um, diagonal in the energy eigenbasis, which means that you wouldn't have coherences between two different uh, non-degenerate energy levels. Now, uh, in this case, we know that um, there are necessary and sufficient state transition conditions that tell you whether um, this is possible or not. And this is written or expressed in what we call the thermal majorization curves. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of how these curves are constructed, um, but you can think of them as a generalization of what we see in entanglement theory, which is majorization. And having some rescaling factors that depend on the, the Gibbs state. Now, uh, thermal majorization would concoct these curves and say that, well, um, the transition is possible if and only if a particular curve of a state lies above uh, your, uh, that of your target state, and the transition would be possible. So this would be the, the straight line would be the thermal majorization curve of the uh, Gibbs state of the system uh, that already thermalized with the bus. So this would be the fixed point actually of um, uh, the set of thermal operations. Um, maybe a nice thing to mention is really that thermal majorization curves are also a special case of what we call uh, quantum Lorentz curves and these have their operational significance in terms of um, state discrimination problems as well. So one thing that you can already see from these state transition conditions is that you have really different classes of states which are incomparable, namely that the transition is not possible from, well, in both directions. Uh, and this is, again, different because if you only care about the free energy, then you can always say one state is more valuable than the other state. Right? This is not the case for thermal majorization anymore. Uh, and this is essentially because you are dealing with a very single shot uh, description of your transitions. So the question is, how, do, how would you bridge the view between these two uh, very different state transition conditions? And the first state, uh, step towards this is to say, well, let's allow for a catalyst. Um, we have also mentioned, uh, Barbara also mentioned this, um, where you really still have energy preserving operations. You still allow free states as Gibbs states, but now you also allow for a catalyst, um, which is any quantum state, as long as at the end of the process, you want this state to be preserved and return exactly as itself. Now, this of course would enable certain types of transitions which were previously not possible via thermal operations by themselves, but now with the catalyst, they become possible. So one remark that uh, I would make is that you notice here that we um, require that the catalyst is the same as its initial self, but it's also decoupled from the system after you trace out the bus. Now, uh, of course, this means that correlations can actually build up between the catalyst and the system and the bus as a whole. 
Um, but what happens is that, well, the, the problem is, is that if you start off with a fresh bath, then your catalyst stays decoupled from your system. Um, and, well, getting fresh bars is, by the resource theory assumption, easy. Um, that's the point. Um, and the state transitions become more relaxed. And it's still relatively easy to find uh, necessary conditions for these transformations to happen. And we call, the, we call them generalized free energies because they look really very similar to the Helmholtz free energy. Um, if you look at this quantity here, the main uh, defining or characteristic quantity here comes in in this D alpha, which is the um, generaliza Rennie generalizations of um, relative entropies. Um, so this would tell you that um, your system can only go via catalytic operations to a state which is closer and closer to the Gibbs version. Um, a few remarks. So the quantity at alpha going to one would give you the standard relative quantum relative entropy here, which then would make this F1 quantity be exactly the Helmholtz uh, free energy of the system. And all of these monotones can be derived directly as a consequence of data processing, but of course there are insufficient conditions. People have also derived other conditions which are also necessary. Um, and this is, a, I guess, a big open problem in, in the paradigm of thermal operations as to how would we find sufficient conditions that would hold for arbitrary quantum states. Now, we however do have necessary and sufficient conditions whenever you already start out uh, in a state which is block diagonal in the energy eigenbasis. In fact, all of these generalized free energies now become also sufficient. Um, so one can see kind of a hierarchy of conditions here. You have thermal majorization being really the strictest one. You have free energy being quite lenient, and then the generalized free energies are kind of a bridge between them. So if you allowed for these exact catalysts, then you get to the generalized free energies. And then the question is, well, how would you reduce this to just the free energy? Now, there are a few ways to go about this. Um, one way, which is maybe less, un, uh, less surprising, would be that if you really take the IID limit, which is the thermodynamic limit, and you also allow for approximate state transitions, so achieving the final state only with epsilon, um, epsilon close to trace distance. Now, um, this is d done by looking at smoothing techniques on the, on the Rennie divergence. Um, it's maybe a bit... Um, um, non obvious actually because you actually have to look at optimal ways to smooth um, the quantum state. But we sort this out in, in this second ref uh, reference here. So IID plus approximate transition is a legit way to go. Um, and there's a, s uh, a more recent work by Müller which proves a very interesting scenario namely that if you have a catalyst, uh, and even if you trace out the bars, you allow the catalyst to retain certain correlations with your system, then in fact you can construct large dimensional catalysts such that you um, converge all of these generalized free energies also back to the uh, free energy plus actually the relative rank of the state. So this is one of the scenarios where it's interesting because a standard for Norman quantity actually finds its significance um, in a single shot uh, transformation. So last of all, I also want to mention um, the, the problem of having inexact catalysis where you, uh, you allow that you say that you allow your, uh, s your catalyst to be returned not exactly but epsilon close. I mean, this sounds reasonable in, in certain sense because, I mean, why would you not allow the catalyst to be just slightly degraded? However, uh, one can show that if you don't have any other restrictions on the dimension or the structure of the catalyst, then you would easily trivialize all the conditions, even the standard free energy. Um, and that's known as endazzling. Of course, if you put some restrictions on uh, your catalyst, then you wouldn't be able to do this. Um, so I have about 10 minutes, yes? Um, and in the last 10 minutes, I think we go through an example of, well, how would we apply uh, generalized free energies results to um, study heat engines. So 
kind of simple, right? If you have, we know that if you have only a heat bus, then second law tells us that, well, you cannot move away from this equilibrium uh, via some operations, you cannot extract work. Now, however, however, if you have two heat bars, uh, which are at different temperatures, then you can make use of this asymmetry, and you can maybe construct a machine that interacts with them in a cyclic way and then outputs energy at the end of the process. So the efficiency is then given by the amount of work you extract uh, divided by the amount of heat that flows out from the hot bus. And I guess the, the kind of most fundamental result that we really know about the efficiency of heat engines is given already uh, by Sadi Kano, which says that if you really have these two heat bars, then the maximum attainable efficiency is really given. Um, um, it doesn't really depend on the specific structures of the bars, but it depends just on the temperatures. And um, you would be able to have like a process that, that does this as at the highest possible efficiency, which is the Kano efficiency. Now, of course, this is usually a very slow process. It's maybe not very physically uh, interesting. Nevertheless, it's, it's one of the fundamental limits that we know from macroscopic thermal, and we want to see how this changes in the um, quantum regime. So, um, translating all of this to the language of catalytic thermal operations, you see that, well, you have two bars, so one of them would be the background free states that you use in your resource theory. Uh, the second one would be the system of interest, which is now a-thermal, so you use it to extract work. So, uh, of course, you could also reverse the role of the hot and the cold bars to perform a similar analysis. To extract work, you kind of, uh, you kind of have a battery system, which you can specify a certain Hamiltonian. And the goal is to kind of extract work and store it in this battery. And lastly, you have the machine, which doesn't really act as an energy source of sink, but it has to kind of go through a cyclic process. So this is just like a catalyst. And um, running this he heat engine would mean um, applying a catalytic thermal operation to the joint system of the coal bars and the battery. And then asking, well, what are the, given the initial setup of your, of your uh, system, what is, um, what are the final states that you can achieve on the coal bus and the, and the battery? So this would, um, in resource theory uh, thermodynamics, you would be applying then catalytic um, thermal operation results onto this joint system. But again, remember that macroscopic thermodynamics would tell us free energy should come in. And indeed, applying free energy to such a scenario would, is why you have, well, the kind of efficiency. So we go through some of the assumptions of the setup. So you have the initial state really being uncorrelated um, across all the partitions initially. The machine goes through this exact cyclic process. And this, the cold bath and the, uh, we assume that the cold bath and the battery can actually be arbitrarily correlated. But the maximum efficiency we show that can, it can be always obtained when you have this tensor product and it greatly simplifies the analysis. And these are just uh, some minimal assumptions that come from the structure of the resource theory itself. Um, we're interested in really storing work um, in as ordered energy. Um, and that uh, we do that by really saying that we have this battery Hamiltonian. And we take it to be like a quasi-continuum. It just means that um, you have discrete energy levels, but you can design the gaps um, as you like. And <coughs> you fix the final and initial states to get work. And the way uh, we have several different quantifications of your quali the quality of the work, and one of them, the most basic one would be, say, perfect work. It just means that you extract energy without incurring any kind of entropy increase in your battery. So for example, you would start your um, battery in some initial energy eigenstate, and you require that at the end of the process you really achieve this um, a higher energy eigenstate that would correspond to extracting perfect work. Of course, the, this is not the only way. You could also have some spread over different energy um, distributions. And going to um, another, uh, the same distribution, but distributed over higher um, uh, amounts of energies. Um, but later, we will look at other, other quantifications of work as well. 
So uh, what happens if you now take the condition that really only the free energy dictates the possibility of running your heat engine, plus the assumption that you really want to achieve perfect work? Um, you actually recover all the nice results of, well, uh, the statements of Sadi Kano, which says that you achieve, well, Kano efficiency, it's always independent of the Bath Hamiltonian, and in fact, what we prove is that this is achieved in what we call the quasi-static limit. It means that in this limit, the final state of the bath actually only changes very infinitesimally in its temperature. Um, I think I will skip the proof for now, but um, uh, essentially, this quasi-static limit is established as one of the most advantageous limits when it comes to uh, really maximizing the efficiency. Uh, of course, it's not the only limit, but um, it, for any non-zero amount of, well, some parameters here, it maximizes the efficiency. And this is, of course, also the unique optimal limit when the bath is already a single qubit. Um, now, what happens is let's try to slightly relax the definition of work and say that, well, I allow you to have some uh, epsilon probability of failure, uh, where you really extract work with one minus epsilon probability and with epsilon probability you fail and the state is somewhere, I don't know where. And this we call near perfect work if the amount of entropy increase in the battery is arbitrarily small compared to the amount of average energy increase in the battery. Now there's a, there's a more formal definition for this and I'm, I'm doing it in a very hand wavy way now. Um, there's a formal definition which involves talking about a sequence of heat engine protocols. Um, but then the good thing to note here is that, well, if you take near perfect work, the requirement, and you apply just the macroscopic free energy, then all of Carnot results can still be recovered. I mean, you could still achieve Carnot efficiency, you could do it independent of Bath Hamiltonian, so on and so forth. Now, the question is, what happens when we substitute the free energy with this whole collective family of generalized free energies? And for the case of perfect work, it's actually, uh, you see a very dramatic departure from the standard case, because now, um, in fact, if your cold bath is already initially a thermal state, which it is, um, you have that you cannot achieve any kind of zero perfect work at all. Well, while this might sound maybe a bit strange, but it ha actually has a very nice analog in information theory, namely uh, zero data, uh, zero error data compression. If you really want to compress your data and do it with absolutely zero failure probability, then uh, it's known that if you already have a full rank probability distribution, you, you cannot do m anything else. You, you just have to encode every symbol that you're given. Um, so there would be no compression coming in here. And in, in a very similar way, this is why we cannot extract work uh, perfectly as well. So since we cannot do this, let's try near-perfect work instead. And indeed, you do start to recover some of the features of Carnot, uh, namely that uh, even if you really you just use the cold bus uh, as one single qubit, you can still achieve uh, Carnot efficiency. And you could do it in the quasi-static limit. Um, of course, the work that you achieve uh, is infinitesimally small because you're in this uh, limit where the bath doesn't really change. Um, but you do achieve this theoretically. And um, the achievability, the, the only thing that remains here now is that the achievability now depends actually on the cold bath Hamiltonian. And we derive some of the conditions for uh, qubits. So uh, why is this the case? I mean, of course, we I already told you that generalized second uh, free energies are coming into play, so you have more constraints that are more stringent. But maybe it's good to check a few things. No? So we know indeed that we, ha we have already applied just the standard second law and recovered everything in the, in the description of our, mo uh, our framework. So it's not a problem of the, of the model itself. Um, it's, well, uh, is it very, is, is it general enough? And these are the assumptions that you have also seen. 
In fact, we explored these assumptions a bit more, and we are also able to relax the conditions on correlations between uh, the bus, the catalyst, and, and the work, uh, and the battery. Um, so th our results would still hold, even if you allow for correlations to build up between the catalyst and the other systems. Um, maybe it's general enough? I don't know. You could tell me whether any of these other assumptions can be still relaxed. Um, but then the other question is really, have we quantified work properly? Is, is this near-perfect work still overly stringent? Uh, to cut the long story short, we look at cases where you extract imperfect work, where the entropy is comparable to the amount of energy. And there what we find is that you can surpass kernel efficiency in the quasi-static limit. You can do it even when the coal bus has only one qubit, so all the generalized free energies come into play. You don't use any other quantum resources such as coherence or entanglement, and yet you surpass kind of efficiency, and this kind of violates the understanding we have about classical thermal. And this should lead us to conclude that this is a very inadequate definition of work. Now, you might say, sure, that seems obvious, no? But the fact is, well, many heat engine analysis have actually fallen into the trap of saying that, well, we achieve Carnot efficiency and this is optimal, where, in fact, you, if you already have a bad quality of work, you might have surpassed the Carnot efficiency instead. So that's kind of maybe uh, a lot to handle. <laughs> but uh, just a quick summary is to say that, well, we looked at heat engines and we find different ways to characterize how good the quality of your extracted work is, and we derive all different bounds for, well, assuming different qualities of your work. And of course, there's a lot of um, interesting future work that I would love to do. For example, deriving these achievability conditions not only for uh, a cold bus of multiple qubits, but also for general um, Hamiltonians. Uh, it would also be very nice to look at more realistic kind of thermodynamic protocols, which are maybe suboptimal in terms of efficiency, but um, extracts more work in a cycle. So this is the end of my talk. And I just kind of want to highlight um, certain problems then when uh, dealing with this uh, resource theoretic framework of quantum thermal. I think it's a very nice framework. It's, it has this very nice mathematical structure. It's very conceptual. Um, it holds for very general systems. But of course, this is also its setback because uh, people complain a lot um, <laughs> about how we bridge this to other more concrete approaches. Um, one, of the, um, one of the complaints that I receive a lot is that, well, uh, in, in the set of your free operations, you don't have measurements because measurements would decrease the entropy and these are very costly. Um, it's no good or useful way to uh, incorporate these measurements as a description in this, in this framework. And uh, it's also like a big hindrance if you want to look at physically interesting demonstrations of these thermal operations uh, in the lab. Because of course, experiments are all about you know, making measurements and doing controls. Um, and that comes in as a challenge for us as future work to continue to generalize and extend this, this mathematical theory. Um, but I will stop here and thanks for your attention. Okay, thank you. Um, we have time for one or two questions. No? Well, I have a question. Um, the ca catalyst uh, thermal operations, can they involve coherence or they are also for diagonal states? Um, so the assumption on coherence is of course only on the initial uh, state. Yeah, yeah. Um, in the process, you could have coherences building up. But, but I mean, can you, can you extend the, the, the sort of catalyst thermal operations to states that already start with some coherence in the energy basis? Mm, no, so this is, um, I think this is the problem that everyone who is working on um, resource theory quantum thermal, they would like to solve it, but mm -hmm. it's not so easy. Um, it's, uh, so people have looked at other sets of operations, namely the, well, what we call the Gibbs preserving sets, uh, operations, which if you think about it, it's the maximal 
set of free operations given that your free state is the Gibbs state. So you allow anything as long as you preserve the Gibbs state. And in that case, you have these necessary and sufficient conditions, which are formulated in, in some entropic terms as well. But the, the problem is really that Gibbs preserving operations are not as physical. You don't have this intuition of really bringing in heat bars and acting. Um, <coughs> for catalytic thermal operations, or even thermal operations themselves, uh, it is always a challenge to look at states which have coherences. In the case where you are achieving the efficiency above the kernel uh, efficiency, if you check for a fluctuation theorem, would you also like violate a fluctuation theorem like uh, Jaziski? I don't know. Is there a correspondence between these two things? Like violating <laughs> things that you should be violating? I'm, I'm not so sure about that. Um, I think the main problem in surpassing kernel efficiency really comes in because you are using a different measure of work. For example, uh, if you look at really the free energy difference in the battery, it is decreasing in this, in this limit. And this is why, although the average energy is increasing, the battery is actually becoming less useful. So um, it's kind of a proof that, well, average energy is not the way to go. But uh, I don't really know if it says anything meaningful on the level of uh, shifting the setting to fluctuation relations. Any other questions? So if not, let's thank Nelly again.